Hello and welcome to Psychology in Seattle. I'm your host, Kirk Honda, licensed therapist. Our shiny new website is up and running, so please check it out, particularly our Support Us page. You can send emails to contact at psychologyinseattle.com. That's contact at psychologyinseattle.com. We always love hearing from our listeners. A reminder that we're going down to just one RSS feed, so please make sure you subscribe to the main feed on iTunes. We have a special guest with us today. Please introduce yourself. Hey, my name is Joe Schaub. I am a lawyer and a therapist in Seattle, Washington. I met Joe in 1996, which was 16 years ago. Can you believe it's been that long? Oh my God. Yeah. He was my instructor in a divorce mediation course, I believe. May have been that, yeah, at did Antioch. You, did you teach a divorce mediation course? No, but we probably, I probably you had, I had you in that class. I remember there's a book you assigned that said something like crazy time and and it was a right. book about how when people go through divorces, they're at their craziest. Right. That's very good. Very good, Kirk. You remember. That's cool. Abigail Trafford. Great book. Great, great book. Abigail Trafford was a, may still be a writer for the Washington Post. Huh. And she went through a very tough divorce after a long, long marriage and did what journalists do. She interviewed a ton of people. She interviewed divorce lawyers and psychologists and judges and mediators and people going through divorce and then she wrote a whole book about what the experience is like and she found that she used a great phrase to start the book she said um i think she called it she said divorce is a savage emotional experience it really mm-hmm. kind of catches your eye yeah you know? and uh, the first six months after separation is in a really really hard time yeah. for people and it kind of that's the time that people kind of you know, kind of turns your world upside down if you hear stories about people like ripping up each other's, the other person's clothes. Or I had a very good friend who told me a story about going out one day to get his paper and the woman who lived across the street from him took the car and rammed it through her own um, garage door across the street. And I looked at him and I said, crazy time Mm. that's what happens it's very very hard time for people that people usually settle down after the first six months but the first period of time is very rough for people yeah yeah so you specialize to some extent with this period of time with people why don't you tell us about that uh you know i do i do individual work with people who are going through the process but you know i think that divorce is a process and the thing and it's like depression you know when people are depressed they honestly believe that they'll never feel better and they, they think that's fact. They think that's the truth. It's not just, and you can look at them and tell them, no, you know, things will get better. But they'll look at you and they'll think you're just lying to them. And it's the same thing with divorce. When people are going through divorce, their world is turned so upside down that they feel that they, that it'll never be okay for them again. And that's just not the case. And most of the studies, like Judith Wallerstein, wonderful woman who died uh, just this year, who was one of the great students and, and, and researchers and writers about divorce, wrote a really good book called Surviving the Breakup with Joan Kelly. Wonderful, wonderful book. Other people say that it takes about two years to recover from a divorce and that means that by the time you're done you can feel like you're okay you're going to be happy you can feel comfortable completely comfortable reconnecting with somebody else what what are some of the signs or experiences that people tell you when they are in recovery from divorce they don't obsess about the other person. They can actually accept the other former partners getting together and coupling with someone else, getting a new partner and have it not spin them out. Do you talk with people about Facebook? Because if you can see someone's social life online, that might be more difficult for you. I think that people who friend an ex-spouse on Facebook. Well, it's good that we're talking about this on a mental health deal because they're crazy. I mean, that's nuts. Why do that? That's going to only drive you crazy. It's only going to drive you crazy. Well, of course it is. How horrible is that? It's like if you're with someone and you love them and they broke up with you and then you go and you just start, you know, cruising in front of their house all the time and you're looking for them all the time. I mean, 
there's a pull. It's definitely going to pull on you. But like, is that good for you? Is that going to make you happy? No, it's not going to make you happy. It's going to drive you nuts. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, Facebook's not not a good idea. So, Joe, you are trained as a lawyer and as a therapist. Can you tell us about that? Started out as a lawyer. Got licensed all the way back in '74 and did a bunch of different kinds of law until uh, I decided that uh, litigation where people really have at it at court, it was super interesting in many ways, but it was just wrecked people. I just hated what people went through with the process of litigation. And uh, one of the real powerful experiences I had in that is I was representing women who had been exposed when they were being carried by their moms to a drug called diethylstilbestrol. They call it now DES. They gave it to women who were pregnant back in the late 40s and into the 50s to try to prevent them from having miscarriages. And it was a um, synthetic estrogen, the first one, and they suggested huge dosages of it. And what happened was that young women who were in their late teens and early 20s, well, a guy named Arthur Herbst, who I know I'm going long here, but it's a great story. So Arthur Herbst, who was a um, oncologist at Mass General Hospital in Boston, had something like seven young women who had this incredibly rare form of vaginal cancer that is like very rarely seen in older women and unheard of in young women. And he had unheard of, never, ever in the literature. And he had like seven of them in his in his hospital at one time, which of course set up some alarms and he checked out what their history was and found out that all of their mothers had taken this synthetic estrogen diethylstilbestrol when they were pregnant to try to keep them from miscarrying. And so it got yanked off the market and I was involved in representing young women against the drug companies saying that they should have known that this was going to be, even back in the 40s, they should have known that it was dangerous in this way. And uh, we would sit around and I'd sit in conference rooms and all these drug company lawyers, almost always just men, would be sitting around and being able to take a deposition, which is asking lots and lots of questions to get information from that person. And they would ask these young women who were in their, you know, late by that time, late late 20s, early 30s, unbelievable questions about themselves. I mean, about their menstruation and their sex histories and all this incredibly invasive stuff, which they were permitted to do. And I would take a number of these cases and one after another, they'd go through the same drill. You were on the plaintiff side? Right. I was representing these women. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I I mean, I came away feeling that litigation was a... uh, it was really kind of a full, you know, full employment act for lawyers in a lot of ways. And the only people that won really were the lawyers. It was incredibly expensive. It really put the people through a lot of stress. And so I um, I'd had good counseling experiences of my own. So I went back to school and I got my master's in marriage and family therapy in uh, 91 and uh, shifted my interest in law to family law and worked as a family lawyer for a long time. Moved to Seattle from L.A. in 95 and... Um, slowly but surely over the course of time kind of shed my legal work because I mean if litigation is crazy and drug liability it's like crazy you know to the nth degree with people going through divorce I mean I I really deeply believe that uh, that divorce for uh, you know you know divorce litigation tortures people Torture. So, um, got out of doing that. Now I do mediation. I do a lot of couples therapy. Uh, love doing that. And, uh, you know, we'll consult with people about divorce. Don't go to court anymore. There's a lot of people who are happy to do it. I can't stomach doing that anymore. Yeah, in my experience, limited experience with people that go through legal battles regarding divorce or custody of children is that the lawyers end up taking control to some extent and they somewhat encourage their clients to fight and to not negotiate. You know, the clients will come to me and say, well, my lawyer says that I have the right to blank. I'm thinking in the back of my head, I don't know if that's gonna work out so well. I don't know if that's the best advice. And uh, I'm guessing that the other lawyer is telling the other party some, you know, opposite advice. And then they go at it. And, it re- you know, and so everything ends up being communicated through the lawyers. And I imagine, and I've done this also, is just 
you know, just let's just sit down with the two of you and try to work this out. It might take some time. You might disagree, but it'll be a lot less expensive. One, it'll create a much better relationship afterwards. And if you have kids, then the kids won't suffer as much. Is that the sort of thing you were running into? Totally, completely. In fact, I think you just said what I would have said. (laughs) I mean, it's absolutely true. It's crazy. Lawyers have an ethical duty to protect their client. If I was getting sued for something or if I was arrested for something and I had to get a defense lawyer, I'd want somebody that was completely and totally on my side. I wouldn't want a lawyer who cared at all about the needs or interests of the other side. If I'm being prosecuted, I don't care about the concerns of the of the DA, of the prosecuting attorney. I, I want to be protected. But divorce is very different because if two people are going to end their marriage, and particularly if they have kids, well, you know, how the wife turns out in this thing is like really important to the husband. And how the husband turns out in this thing is like really important to the wife. I read a very interesting piece a while ago that said that lawyers, they call it monetize outcomes. So lawyers think about outcomes in terms of dollars in a very natural way. That's the way lawyers think. So for lawyers, it's very important to make sure that their clients have a certain amount of money, you know, that, that, that there's no dollar left on the table that their client could get. And also they're there to protect their clients. So if I go in to see a lawyer, the lawyer is going to give me a whole rap about how listen, this is what the law says. This is what you're entitled to. Here is how I can protect you. And uh, by the time I walk out of that office, I'm going to be really paranoid. I've talked to so many people that walk into lawyers' office who are like good lawyers, not bloodthirsty people. You know, there are barracudas out there who are obnoxious, but there's a lot of people who are incredibly high level, a lot of integrity, good folks. And, you know, people walk out of their offices, they're flipping out. They're so paranoid because the lawyers uses language like, I want to protect you. I want to make sure you get what you're entitled to. And it creates a paranoid adversarial mindset in people that is going to really hurt them and Lord knows it's going to hurt their kids. Mm. So what do you propose as an alternative to that? Oh, thank you. What a great question. So I came in here into your studio saying that I want to talk about collaborative law. And that is the question that leads me right into it. Collaborative law, collaborative divorce is this incredible process that, by the way, are you, how much do you know about it? I've just heard things through students of mine who have talked about taking the training, I believe. Right. So not much. Okay. Collaborative divorce is all over the country and it's got a really great community here in Seattle and um, the story about how it began is I think a great story there's a guy named Stu Webb who recently retired who back in the early 90s was a very well regarded successful conventional family lawyer in Minneapolis and he was so sick of the toxic nature of collaborative I mean I'm sorry of regular divorce he was so exhausted by it and so he decided he wasn't going to go to court anymore and he had a number of cases so he sent messages and letters out to his colleagues on the other side of cases and he said hey I want to continue working with you on this case but I'm not going to court anymore and I want us to figure out what to do without going to court and if you're willing to do that with me and explore that with me let's do it And only a handful of people agreed because lawyers are very nervous about having, you know, having to talk about cases without having the option of going to court. So, like, if we don't agree, okay, fine, I'll see you in court. And lawyers kind of say that's the way it is. And it's very, you know, goes without saying, a second nature for lawyers just to go to court if you can't agree. Problem with that is you are getting somebody in a robe, who doesn't know any of the people involved, has got a lot of stuff on their plate, is preoccupied with their own concerns, and can't spend that much time on people's situation, and also have a lot of oftentimes unacknowledged prejudices about how they feel about men, or women, or marriage, or God knows what. Have you seen that play out? Oh, yeah. If you you ask most lawyers in Seattle and they talk about divorce, they mean they will say that people who sit on the bench, they will say, oh, this is a good person there. They're pretty straight up. Oh, this you represent a husband. Don't go to this person. Oh, you're with the wife. This is probably a good person for you to go to. For example, in this day and age, what happens if you have two people, they've been married 
the woman has been working and the guy has been like staying home, maybe taking care of the kids. Much more common now than it was in the days of John Lennon when he was a house busman, right? So this happening now and they get divorced and they go to court and the husband says, I need some time to get resituated. I need some education. Uh, I need spousal maintenance. That's what they call alimony in Washington. I need spousal maintenance. Courts think differently about guys going into court asking for spousal maintenance than they do about women doing it. It's harder for guys to get a court to order them to have spousal maintenance because there's prejudices about that. Guys, and Lord knows, they're, I'll tell you, get me started here. You know, I... Um, I used to believe when I was litigating, I used to believe that courts were, especially in a place like Seattle, really even handed about gender issues around parenting. And I would work with guys who spent a lot of time parenting their kids when they were, people were together. And then they get divorced, and there are a number of people who sit on the bench who just are prejudiced against men as parents. Now. You know, it's not a lot of them, but there are enough of them, and it is, uh, it's a real concern. I, you know, I would represent guys, and they'd be all worried about whether there would be, you know, uh, there would be a bias in a judge because they're guys around parenting. And I'd say, no, 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 we'll put on the evidence, and there's a lot of stuff you have to say about how, you know, how much time and the care and concern and what you did. And almost invariably, the guy's lost. And after a while, I kind of had to shake my head and talk to colleagues and say, I was naive, man. I thought that this was, it was more even-handed than that. Now, you'll get people who are on the bench who will certainly argue about that and say that's not true. But that's not my observation, and that's not the observation of a lot of other people that do this work. Yeah, I, I've observed similar sorts of, shall we say, uh, experiences where I look at the judge and I think, I don't know if you know exactly what you're talking about, particularly in family court, because it gets so messy and people get upset. I, I've seen judges react emotionally to the situation and seem to lose their cool. We tend to think of judges as these superhuman people, and of course they're not. They're regular human beings, right? I don't think of them as superhuman people. Well, you don't because you've been around them enough, right. but the general public, you know, that's why they sit up in that chair far away from us up high. Right. And we don't, I've always wondered why we don't just sit around a big table. By the way, I have a chair like that that goes up high around my dining room table so that my family will look at me that way. Yeah, that's right. It sets a it precedent. Works. It sets a precedent that, you know, you're, you can't be messed with. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll have to do the toilets, you know. Yeah, that's right. Okay. It's like you can just sit there and start making judgments and, and yeah. pro proclamations yeah. of various sorts. No one's going to take a proclamation from sit from someone sitting at eye level. That's just right. That's just a known psychological fact. Right. But the thing that I wonder about, because I actually have a friend who's a judge, and she sometimes tells me about her insecurities, and I wonder, do judges have a way of helping themselves with this bias? You know, a therapist, that's constantly what we're doing all the time. We're constantly consulting and getting therapy and reading. Da -da -da. It's a big part of our job. But I somehow think that judges just think, well, I'm a judge now. I, I must be without bias. I must not. I've been given the the privilege or something, I and I don't need to do anything to hone it. Do, do you know if judges just do anything to help them with their bias? I guess I have two answers for that. One answer is that judges are constantly going through trainings around bias. Mm. They do a lot of, they do stuff around gender bias and certainly, you know, racial and ethnic bias. I mean, they, they are strongly encouraged to explore those things. Are those required or are they? I don't know. I think they're, I think they're required. Yeah, I think they're required, but they're required here. I don't know if they're required in other jurisdictions, you know, but that's not to say though, that it's that necessarily effective because one of the interesting differences between my mental health training and my legal training and my mental health practice and my legal practice is that lawyers are really not encouraged to do a lot of self-exploration figure out what's going on what drives them what makes them happy there was a fantastic study that is still cited all over the place by a guy here at, he's at University of Washington, a guy named Andy Benjamin. He and some other people did studies of lawyers and law students back in the mid-90s here in Washington and in Arizona. And it's a 
couple of studies that are cited all over the place. And they found that lawyers have a dramatically higher incidence of depression, of substance abuse, of paranoia. Uh, and they've given you know a number of these instruments to people before law school and then during law school and then after law school and they have absolutely tracked this dramatic rise in all of these indicia of distress in people that the seeds are definitely sown in the law school experience but they sprout and they're still pretty sturdy with deep roots once people are in the practice so you know uh, lawyers and judges really are not encouraged to do that kind of self-exploration. Lawyers use a term a lot um, in a negative tone. They say something is touchy-feely. They say, oh, that's too touchy-feely. And you hear lawyers complain and, and criticize something as touchy-feely a lot. And what are they saying? I mean, yeah. feelings? I mean, lawyers get angry pretty easily, but other feelings, vulnerable feelings? Right. No way. Right, and particularly for judges, maybe. And then I go to a dinner party, and the judge is crying as she's telling me about her insecurities. And 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 uh, I wonder, as she's doing this, I'm thinking, does anyone else talk with you about this? Because the things you're, the stresses you're under are sig significant. I mean, I think about my job, and I think it's nothing compared to the amount of pressure a, a judge is under on a daily basis. Absolutely, absolutely. So, getting back to collaborative law briefly, you know, what happens is, is that. This idea that Stu Webb came up with about let's figure this out and not go to court really started to capture people's imaginations, particularly lawyers' imaginations, because Stu Webb and a couple of few people that agreed with him in how to handle this weren't the only people around the country who said, oh man, the way divorce is handled in courts is torturing people. And I am not I am not using, you know, hyper, hyperbole when I say that. It tortures people. It wrecks people. It, um, you know, I'd said that the recovery process for divorce is, you know, maybe around two years by a lot of uh, uh, observers and researchers. If you put people through a horrible litigated divorce process, their recovery from divorce stretches out for years beyond that if they ever recovered because they're dealing with the wounds that are inflicted by an adversarial legal process that's laying on top of this incredible trauma they're having by taking this deep attachment, adult attachment relationship, the only one really in their lives that gets ruptured and flips them out. And then they've got, you know, the paranoia and the fear that attends litigation. So let me tell you really quickly what, what uh, Stu Webb and these guys did. They said, well, what are we going to do about, you know, making an agreement? We won't go to court. And they came up with a contract that the lawyers and the two people going through divorce all sign at the beginning. And they say, we sign this contract and promise we will not go to court to have anything adjudicated, have some other person that doesn't know any of us make a decision that will impact our lives, we will work it all out by agreement. And if we have a hard time, if we're emotional, if things get stirred up for us, we'll get the help we need and we'll keep coming back to the table until we get it done. And the kicker was the part of that agreement that gave it some bite, I guess I'd say, that gave it some enforcement is that if either person had a lawyer go to court for them in a motion or something where a judge had to make a decision rather than just kind of you know enter some agreed order, but actually were arguing about something. If either person went to court, both lawyers had to withdraw, and these people had to get litigating lawyers. So there was a bit of leverage to keep people in the process because some lawyer that these people, you know, each person had developed a relationship with and who knew the case and they'd spent a fair amount of dough getting them up to speed on their lives and what was going on, all of a sudden those people had to be gone and they had to get new people. So that was leverage for the clients? It was, the sort, it was sort of leverage for the process. It kind of kept people from going, ah, I'll go, forget it, I'll go to court. Because they couldn't use the same lawyers that they had been working with and go to court. It also seems like it would be leverage against the lawyers because they would have to drop the case. That's right. That's exactly right. But the point of that is that lawyers who get involved in this process 
are almost always very committed to the process. They're very committed. Because they care more than they care about money. Well... Because it'd be more lucrative if they went to court, right? Well, that's true, but... To say that lawyers, uh, that's the thing I've really struggled with over the years, you know, Kirk, because I mean, I've been a lawyer for a long time and, and I like lawyers. I mean, I have really close, dear friends who I love and trust who are lawyers who are really fantastic people. To say that lawyers do these things like whip things up for so they can, you know, make more money, you know, in part, I kind of push back against that for a long time because, in fact, there are a lot of lawyers who are so committed to making sure their their clients are, quote, protected, I'm making air quotes right now, okay, that they're protected, that they can really talk themselves into getting really, you know, whipping it up just because they want to protect their clients. So for a long time, I felt, well, it's not just because they want to make money, but sad to say, I've come to believe over the last 10 years from what I've seen, there are a lot of lawyers who, you know, the only way they can manage to have the kind of lifestyle that people strive for, the upper middle class, upper class lifestyle that people strive for in our society now, the, the, the you know, we can have a whole show on the, the twisted values that are created in our society that push people to do that. But to the extent that people want to push for that, to be able to have money to send their kids to private schools because the local schools aren't any good, or to be able to have vacations, or to whatever, you know, um, they got to find a way of generating income. And the way lawyers generate income is not by selling products that you can build up a market for. It's by selling your time. And so the more time you put into something at a particular hourly rate, the more money you make. How much would it cost a client to go to court in a typical adversarial divorce? What, what, what well, put it put a number on? Yeah, it. Tip, it, well, you know, I'm thinking like thirty grand a person or something. Ten grand, ten to thirty grand a person. Well, that's about right. I mean, it's um, ten's a little low. Thirty grand is maybe normal to a little above normal. So that's where you get the lawyers. They start working stuff out. There's some there's some disagreements. You go to court. They start throwing stuff back and forth. The judge makes a ruling. That process can take a year or so. Custody issues, that sort of thing. And 20, 25 grand each from each client. Definitely. And if it really heats up, 50 grand each, 75 grand each, 100 grand or more each. But of course, when you're getting people spending that kind of money, one of two things are happening. They're either so loaded and they're dealing with, you know, such high assets that they don't, you know, that that money still is, you know, clearly is not going to change their lifestyles to spend. Or they're in such pain, they, they're impaired. A lot of times they have character disorders and they're just so flipped out. And uh, the end of a marriage just triggers a, just, just a dive right into the dark well of their pain and they work it out in the divorce. Right, I just realized that. There, there must be some interesting people that end up looking for lawyers for a divorce. But tell me if this is accurate, the things that I've seen. So for instance, you have a woman who is fighting for primary custody of the kids and she, there's some arguments about money. And so, so the lawyer and her start building up their case. They start building up evidence that he should give her money and that he shouldn't have as much custody as he's asking for. So they start looking for evidence that he is a bad person. And let's say she starts off with saying, well, he's not that bad of a parent. There's some things I have some complaints about, but it's not that big of a deal. But in order to win in court, you have to get evidence. And so she might say, well, he was really rough with the kids once and they got a bruise. And then, you know, and the lawyer might say, well, so can we say that was kind of abusive? Was it was it a little over the top? Do you worry about the safety of the children? Uh, sure. If that will help us win, because I know he's going to come with his evidence and then you go to court and you have this guy who thinks that his ex-wife thinks he's a good father in general and this lawyer is saying my client says that you're an abusive person and that you can't be trusted with the children and the whole purpose is just to get primary custody not to take the children away from this guy but because of the adversarial nature of the court that can be very traumatic right is that what you're talking about that's one of the things i'm getting stressed out here and you talk about that <laughs> But that's the sort of trauma, right? Where yeah. you have someone that you're divorcing from and there's already hurt feelings and then you add on top of it this over-the-top evidence building and mudslinging at each other. Uh, I mean, you don't go to court to say nice things to each other. Well, right. And one of the things that you want to keep in mind that it doesn't really have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be these accusations of really 
terrible conduct. This is all in pub in the public arena. Everything that's being said is public. And if I want to persuade someone in a robe to rule in my favor, I've got to give them evidence. And even if the evidence is I pay a lot of attention to my kids and here's all the things I do and I am and and my spouse doesn't pay that much attention to the kids. They're not as important to him as they are to me. And here's why. And I'm a little concerned about that. It doesn't even have to be claims of abuse. That kind of stuff standing alone in a public forum. Well, what's the other person going to do? They're going to go to court and they're going to say, no, 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 no. I am way more invested in the kids than, the other, than they say I am. And in fact, they're not really that as invested as they say they are. Standing alone, that kind of stuff isn't going to set people's hair on fire. But in a public forum, in the highly stressed environment of a divorce, even that stuff will just torture people. Mm. It will cause them to become so polarized. So do you provide trainings for therapists and, and lawyers? Um, I, help me understand that. Yeah. I've also heard collaborative divorce. Is that different from collaborative law? Nah, it's the same thing. Okay. It fits divorce pretty much better than any other kind of area of law. But people try to use it in other areas of law but they're nervous because what happens is is that if someone actually has to go to court and the lawyer withdraws well I don't just withdraw my whole firm withdraws and then the business will get another law firm to represent them and if that law firm does a good job well maybe I'm gonna lose that company as an ongoing client so the idea of having clients that you know that you have for over the course of time, over multiple kinds of cases and affairs, doesn't really lend itself as well to collaborative law. But divorce does because usually it's a one-shot deal. So someone hears about collaborative divorce and they look in the phone book for someone who specializes in that. And they might also look for a therapist that helps with that. Help me understand that. Great. Well, first of all, if they went and they looked in the phone book, then they'd probably get on their horse and they, you know, on their and their and their buggy, and they'd go down to the saloon for a beer or something. But the organization is called the International Academy of Collaborative Professionals, the IACP. And you can find on their on their website, which it will show you all the people who are members of the IACP who are in that state. The thing that I haven't mentioned about collaborative law, which makes it a really powerful approach, is it's not just lawyers. There is a team of professionals who assist people with this incredibly wrenching transition in their lives. They're trained to do what uh, Pauline Tesler, who is a you know, San Francisco Bay Area lawyer, who is one of the sort of many people consider her the godmother of uh, collaborative law. She was very, very powerful force in it for a long time, and she's trained in it, trained it for years. She's written books in it. And Pauline has said for years she's talked about the paradigm shift. And the paradigm shift is really for lawyers who shift from, I need to protect you from the other person and make sure you get what you're entitled to, and a shift from saying, what does this family need? How can I help you get what get what you need? How can I help you understand what you need that's not just defined by dollars? What do you need? What's important to you? What are your interests? What are your needs? And what's the other person's needs? And how can we work so that both of you feel heard in this process? That's not the way lawyers think. No, you know, naturally, and it's not what lawyers' training is. So you go through a really focused, specific training to help lawyers shift their thinking about this. And you also have a mental health professional who will be involved, or they call them a coach. And what they do is they're brought on for the specific purpose of supporting people and especially around the emotional elements of getting divorced. They help with things like um, communication. They help with de-escalation of conflict. So they might actually directly say to one of the divorcing parties, look, you know, maybe if you said it in this way, or do you understand what the other person is saying? Can you repeat back what the other person is saying to them? That sort of thing? That is that is absolutely one of, the, one of the possibilities of what can be done. I mean, I do a lot of coaching and I utilize a lot of the stuff uh, from Gottman mm -hmm. in terms of conflict and so you have you have you have each partner that in the marriage that's divorcing you, they each have a lawyer as well there's a financial specialist who's neutral and then there's a coach who's neutral 
How much does it cost overall, lawyers, coaches, and financial people? So here's the basic deal with collaborative law. People used to think that doing a collaborative divorce was cheaper than a basic litigated divorce. Not a crazy litigated divorce, but a basic litigated divorce. And the truth is that that may be so, but not in any dramatic sense. So, for example, if somebody would pay 10000 to 12000 dollars in a fairly decent, you know, non high level litigated divorce, you know, maybe each, each, right. each, yeah. right. Maybe they'll spend, you know, seventy five hundred to ten thousand dollars a piece for a collaborative divorce. They might spend a bit less. Maybe they'll spend ten percent, fifteen percent less than in a litigated divorce, but the and this is in a you know, a non-intense litigated divorce where the costs, you know, start to really just really spin out of control, 25000 30000 or more per person. But the thing that's important is that the outcome you're getting is so much better because you are able to find a way of maintaining a decent, respectful relationship with this person that you were married to, and now you're not going to be married to him anymore, and that is a trauma for people. There's a guy in our community named Jeff Shushan who I think says who said something that really moved me once. He said, one of the things we talk about is this notion of being able to dance at our kid's wedding, and that's something people think about. He said, but the, the thing that he talks to people about is he wants them to have a relationship that is supportive and respectful and, you know, and distant. I mean, disconnected because they're no longer intimately involved, only through their kids, but such that if when the day comes when one of them dies, the children will be able to turn to the other parent for support and even go to the graveside and feel that they can get all the support they can possibly get from this loving parent over the loss of the other parent without any static, without any weird feelings. And it's just, it's just a completely loving, supportive experience. And I thought, boy, that's a nice way of kind of thinking about it. I'm surprised that it costs that much. It seems as though you could hash it out fairly quickly and inexpensively, no? No. And here's why. Because, I mean, you can sometimes, no doubt about it. But, you know, the issues that people struggle with in divorce, whether it's collaborative or, you know, non-collaborative, they run deep for people. They're, they're powerful. I mean, just because you decide to get a collaborative divorce doesn't mean that the husband doesn't think the wife spends too much money on stuff that's frivolous and the wife doesn't get upset about it because she thinks he's controlling her and that, um, you know, he wants to, and he's judging her. And the other thing about the process that I like is that we talk a lot about this notion of pacing in divorce and the sense that almost always, if you read the literature and talk to people about this process, almost always one person leaves the marriage emotionally before the other one does. It's true. Someone leaves and someone gets left and their experience is going to be different. And the person who leaves normally they've been struggling with it for a long time. It's extremely painful for them. They've made the decision. They feel guilty often about making the decision. But once the decision is made, they kind of want to figure out what the next step of their lives are, is because they've emotionally disengaged from this other person as a spouse. The other person, they didn't, even though the, the marriage was bad, they didn't see this coming oftentimes. So they really need the time and space to wrap their mind around this incredibly intense shift in their lives. And so they may feel betrayed and angry and outraged, uh, or if not that dramatic, just really you know, deeply sad and, 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 and grieving. And so it's going to take them some time. So the person who leaves kind of wants the process to go fast so they can kind of figure out what the next step is. And the person who is left kind of needs the process to go slower so they can wrap their minds around how they're going to make these incredibly important decisions in their lives. So you have to balance the needs of both people in that. And so the process doesn't go 
quite as fast as people would think. Here's the important thing to remember, I guess, is that just because people choose the collaborative law process doesn't mean that they are self-selected as people who basically get along and don't have serious issues to deal with. The, the, the beauty of the collaborative process is that except for I mean, this you might get debates from some people who are conventional divorce lawyers, but I truly believe that except for a, you know, a certain subsection of groups, who people who get divorced, like where there is um, mostly where there is domestic violence, uh, you know, or, or really sort of intractable mental illness, characterological issues, except for those things, you can... People can go through a collaborative divorce process. They can be in conflict. They can be pissed at each other. They can have they can have all kinds of disagreements. Doesn't mean that they can't go through the collaborative process. In fact, it means they should use that process because the key to the process is supporting people. They have this, there's a phrase we've used for a long time. It's like it's a container for people. And you'll talk to collaborative lawyers who like put their hands together like a little bowl in front of them, like the container. That's what it is. You're, mm -hmm. you're, you're supporting people through a very, very difficult process. So it's not as fast as people might think. How, how fast? Like a year? Anywhere between four months and nine months. Documents have been filed and it's all done in... Right. From the first time the lawyers and clients meet to the final, final... And this involves individual meetings with clients and group meetings with everybody. Right. It can be any kind of, it can be, a, you know, different constellations. It can be, I mean, I work now as a coach. I don't work as a lawyer, right? So I got two cases still where I'm still acting as a lawyer. But, you know, when those are done, I'm not, I, I'm turning down those cases now, but taking on cases as okay. a coach. I don't want to be a lawyer anymore because I really super enjoy the mental health element of it. I really enjoy supporting people in this way. But I'll second that emotion. I also enjoy working with couples a lot. I have recently run into a student who says she doesn't ever want to work with couples. And I think, yeah, you're really missing out on... Because to see people love each other, and it goes for family therapy too, it can be quite moving. And when you're in individual therapy, which is also gratifying, but to see husband and wife or two partners look at each other and go, I'm glad we worked that out. I really feel in love with you in this moment. And I'm just sitting there watching that, witnessing that. I It, it just makes my day. There's not a dry eye in the house. That's right. Right. I know. It's great. It's great stuff. Part of it that makes it so much fun is that, you know, people will walk in and they'll start talking about something that's happening between them. And when you're trained a certain way, you listen to what they say entirely differently than the way they're thinking. It's like you're looking at something with different lenses and you start feeding your view of what you're watching, which is entirely different to them. And it's so incredibly supportive to them because, you know, what people do when they're fighting, when they're in conflict, when couples are in conflict, man, you know, they just... You know, they'll sit in your office and they'll start going over one of their fights and you'll watch them and you'll look at them and say, you don't need to do this in here because I'll bet you do it exactly like this at home, right? And they go, yeah. I say, well, you know, so don't waste your time and money coming and doing it in here. Let's let's talk about what's, you know, let's, let's talk about let's, another way of seeing what's going on. And if you have a, uh, you know, if you have a, uh, like an attachment lens that uh, Sue Johnson and the Emotionally Focused Couples people you know, promote, it's a fantastic healing lens. And it, it just encourages such compassion for people in the depths of their pain around this stuff. Great. Well, thanks for joining us, Joe. Hey, thanks a lot, Kirk. This is really fun. Yeah. Well, that does it for another episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining us and please take care of yourself.